Ladies and gents, hello and a very warm welcome. My name is Aram. Welcome to the Competitive Rowing Technique channel. Technique, training, planning, and everything that belongs to it. Now, this video is a community video analysis. As you know, I get sent quite a bit of footage and whenever there's time, I pick footage and try to help where I can. Now, if you want to send your footage, do it, but with the permission that I use it on YouTube. So I get a lot of requests on um, Instagram, um, starts to happen in Rowing Zone now too, where I can look at this and look at this and look at this. Very happy to help for free if the entire community benefits. This is Zach Rossiter. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. You're coaching this eight and you sent me the footage. You also said that this is not the best representation of a technique. This is what I've got. So it's important if you sent me something, make sure it's a video you can actually work with. I suppose this is, otherwise you wouldn't have sent me that. And I, I suppose kind of secretly you said, well, I, we could do better, don't be too harsh. I'm not harsh, I just um, critique what I've got. Now, first of all, this aid um, seems to be a novice aid. Zach, you are an aid seat of this aid, you're two years into college and you rode in high school. So you do have a rowing background, but you're rowing and you're coaching, that is very, very difficult to do. So a couple of things, you see, Everybody who's in, everybody's been into professional rowing knows exactly what the next steps are and there's so and so many things to do in order to harmonize the boat. And this is exactly what I want to do right now. How would you go about if you have an aid like this? So the first thing is everybody needs to get together and understand how does this aid actually function. And the way it works is very simple. Essentially it's a quad with eight people just like a pair is a single with two people. It's a bit more difficult than that. But overall, you get the point. That by that I mean, you don't have, like, like on the barb over here, you've got, you've got two oars. Later on, I'm gonna do a video of how to mount the full oars. You see this? <laughs> this thing, it's probably not in focus right now, but this thing, that oar goes right on that barb or pro. So you've got two oars, one person holds the left, one person holds the right. If you were in a single and you did this, the boat will very likely tip to the right because the right oar pushes down first, the right blade goes out first, boom, offsets the boat towards the unstable side and therefore you will tip. Now imagine you would row a pair. Well, the most fundamental thing is, hey, we gotta act like we were single. Do it at the same point of time, but it's not just the same point of time we were tapped down. It's how your blade ends up um, at, the, at the finish. So the question is, how long here, how long are they covered and how much are they covered until they are at the finish? And uh, the thing is you can't change this um, at, at that position. So you say you were at that position, say, okay, I want to keep my blades in a bit longer. No, 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 this is not how it works. You cannot change it there. There's too much load on the blade, ideally. If you're going no power at all and just tiptoeing your way through the drive, well, then it may work. But you don't want to do this. I mean, there is no forward propulsion if you tiptoe your way through the drive. So you can't change it there. The thing is, you have, whatever you do, you got to be so consistent and you got to be in the water until the very end. And you see, this is not quite the case here because the most experienced rowers here on eight, Zach, which is you, that rower, of course, is in the water the longest. You also pull most of the boat because you have a longer connection. So you need to end up at the same spot. I'm gonna talk about how to do this just in a moment. Let's say everybody ended up in a, in a comparable position on both sides. We just see port side, stroke side, okay? So let's say this is even. What's the next step? Well, everybody in the aid has to understand that you need to tap down at exactly the same time and exactly the same depth. And this is where usually things start to fall apart. So at, at the finish, you want to push down always to the same depth. You can, let's say you're in two seat right here. And I'm not referring to you specifically. Um, I'm just any position in that boat, but one and two has a lot of influence over the boat stability. I like to put pretty heavy guys in bow if it's possible, because it just nicely sets the boat. 
If you think, oh, coach said Blake's off the water. Boom, now I'm tapping down more. Blake goes off the water very high. The entire boat is offset. So what happens? The rest of the boat becomes a bit nervous. And says, oh, what, what, what's going on? And they try to compensate in weird ways. In an eight, in any sweep boat, you have to be ultra, ultra predictable and reliable. So whatever you do and whatever you change, keep it. I suggest to keep it for 90 seconds. That's about the intention span that we've got before we go back into automation. A rowing stroke has so much automation in it because, hey, in a, in a typical training sessions, I don't know, you would do a thousand strokes or more. Uh, just a race, a 2K race alone is 240 strokes. So at least a thousand strokes in a rowing session, at least. And then you end up at a point of time where things have to be automated. If it's not automated, well, you can't process so many triggers at the same point of time. So automation is our friend, but also our enemy. So make sure you focus on something for 90 seconds. That's about the maximum attention span we've got. And then focus on something else. So if you say, okay, I want to tap down a bit more because my blades are off the water. And, and, and let's say you want to tap down a bit more because you figure out, okay, my blades always touch the water and everybody else is not. The boat is still set now. So when you start to tap down a bit more, you're going to offset the boat. That is okay for the sake of you being off the water and being more harmonious with the rest of the team. But seven other people need to adapt as well. And if you only adapt for five strokes and then ooh, well, your mind wanders off somewhere else, everybody's screwed. Sorry to put it that bluntly, but it's a fact. There's nothing worse, in my humble opinion, than rowing in a sweet boat where everybody's kind of doing his or her own thing. It's, it is frustrating. So at that stage, A, if you change something, keep it. Keep that, keep that change for at least 90 seconds so everybody can adapt. And then you will probably enjoy it so much because everybody had time to adapt that you want to keep it. That's the tricky part. And the reason why it's easier to roll with more experienced sweep rowers is because they have better automation. They have something more effective automated Typically, not always. The thing is, once you tap down consistently to the same height, consistency is the key, then you can start to focus on something else. And the next thing is, what is on the way forward? So there's a nice video of that ever so famous Kiwi 8 that Tony Connor coached. And when I did the original video analysis a year ago, two years ago, I don't know even more, I realized they did a two-stage tap down. So at the finish, they tapped down once, and that's important to know. Then it went out a bit more where you create more space between your thighs and, and the oar handle. And then you tap down a slight bit more because it is utopious to do everything here. If you try to do everything here, you end up with something that looks like that typical thing that people do. Say, oh, you rower. Ah, I know. No, 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 no. Rowing is this, a bit of it, not much. Okay. So you go in straight, tap down, tap down, and you go forward again. And that, of course, brings another difficulty, another level of difficulty, because, hey, how do you synchronize the timing? But it works. It works. I um, briefly worked with uh, an Asian country. I don't want to call a name yet because they still have to pay the invoice, which they decided not to do. So it's the last time I probably will work with them. And they got it. They got it figured out then. But it takes time. You need, as a coxswain, if, if you're a coxswain that boat, you need to be extra precise in your timing. So usually in the boat, you've got people who are auditory, so they need rhythm, um, a rhythm and a sound, and they need something that is predictable always at the same time and a pattern. So structure, rhythm, and sound. This is the most important thing for auditory people. Um, then you've got the visual people. They need to see it. If they don't see it, they don't understand it. And then you've got the kinesthetic kind of people. If they don't feel it, forget it. You can show them as much as you want, they will not get it. So as a coxswain, you need to trigger all these three um, internal communicator types of people. And the longer you roll, at least with me, that was the case, the more, these, the more you merge into a type that can do all three. But it takes years. So as a coxswain, I recommend you do drills like, all right, we're going to tap down now. A double tap down. We're going to do a double tap down. One. And before you start the drill, you need to get everybody together and say, please pause at the catch now. We're going to stop the boat. Put your blade squared in the water. 
tap down now. If the bow feels like a caterpillar, okay, you're gonna stop from here. So the way it works is that I usually say, okay, entire eight, I try if that's possible, entire eight, um, both hands on the oar handle, and I want you to look at the boat. I want you to, to listen to the sound when the blades get out of the water, and I want you to feel the balance or imbalance. You got me? All three, okay? Everybody will resort to his or her very uh, specific communication style anyway. So, boat is in a standstill, you say, tap out now, boom. First of all, everybody will tap out at a much different time. Tap out now, what? The other one, ready! So you get the caterpillar again. It takes time before the crew learns to work together. Once you've got this figured out and it stands still, um, you need to make sure that everybody taps down equally. Just about the same depth. Tap down, it's cocks and you look. Is that a line or is it like this? Synchronize. And that is something that's so important. You have to be on them. Not in a negative way, but say you can't, you can't let anybody get away with half decency. Either it is good or it is not. There's nothing in between. It doesn't mean you have to be born perfect, but you've got to strive for that. Don't accept a half-baked solution. Don't do this. So it is tap down, and I want to see the same level. If I don't see the same level, I'm going to be on that case. Same level. Same level. Oh, I can't, oh, I don't know, I'm frustrating. Hey, if you can't take it, leave. With all the friendship, rowing is not about being, oh, it's okay, you know, it was such a hard day in the way. Hey, rowers are a tough breed. So if you want to be competitive, you've got to be on your case. You've got to be really good at that. Next step, once you have a certain level that you can accept for that one drill, and you be sure you come back to this on a frequent basis, then you say, okay, we're going to tap down and fetter. Tap, boop. So if that doesn't work and the boat is a caterpillar, then you know, okay, people behave differently when they're forced to fetter. Because most people fetter, if this is the waterline, most people fetter with the blade being slightly, slightly in the water. Which is okay. Every exit and every entry concerning the water will be either a wash in at the catch or a wash out. The question is, how much is the blade out at the finish before you fetter? The more it is out, the better. But there's no such thing, in my humble opinion, where you leave with a perfectly square plate. That is robotic. It will not work. We need a bit of fluidity. You need to adapt to everything there is. Same with the catch. You know, going straight, boom, because it's going to disrupt the boat run. It will be a wash. And the question is, how much airstroke do you have before you have a water connection? The less, the better. So, drill two, tap down, fetter. This is where you can listen a lot. <laughs> One of the most beautiful sounds of a quarter and eight, boom, that fetter sound, gorgeous. Once this works, and it's going to be more, more, more um, difficult and unstable because there's no water pressure on the hull because the boat isn't plowing through the water. So of course it's going to be challenging. However, the next step is going to be, okay, we're going to roll. And it's going to be feel like caterpillar. And then you say, okay, at the finish, Tap down, fetter, hold. And that is something you can do every single turn. When I grew up rowing, 10 years old, this is the first thing I learned. The moment you have a bit of balance, hey, you want to let it glide out. This is how we call it. You want to let it glide to a, to a standstill. And when you do this, uh, you end up with a lot of stability. It's just a game. It's also important not to be too, it has to work. No, relax, take it easy. See it as a game. If you can see it as a game, excellent. If you see this work, it's not gonna work. Things are, add a playful character. Have high ambitions, but give it a bit of a playful character. You don't wanna to be too strict. Everything that's too strict is gonna break. Okay, next step. Once this is working, you can start to let the boat glide out, half slide. So you would go, tap out, fetter, half slide, hold, let it glide out. And people who start to do this, I said, no. Everybody in the boat needs to understand the initial exit, um, the initial blade exit from the water has more to do with your boat stability than anything else. And then the next step is how deep you go and how long can you hold it? And if you force 
the bow to be set at half slide, it means that people can't do this. Let's say I'm rowing port side now. Down, up here, down, tap down, rotate, and then oh, it's comfortable you go up at half slide. No, you want to tap down, hold, and then have a slope of your hand up. And that slope should start a bit after three quarter slide. The rougher the conditions, the later it should start. So the blade should come close to the water, but it needs space. So you want to let the boat glide out at half slide. You want to let the boat glide out at one quarter slide. You want to let the boat glide out at three quarter slide. 2013, I think it was, I went to Mont La Jolie in France. And the, the French have, I can, I, pr I can probably say the French because I found this with many French rowers. And my first coach was French too, maybe this helped. Um, they have a, pr a precision in their blade work that I've never seen with any other nation as consistently as with the French. It is, I, I was, I, it was French uh, large boat championships, I think. And they had almost, almost every second crew was capable of doing this. Push off the dock, into the shoes, finish position, blade squared in the water. Um, I don't know their French command and then this is ready row. And they tap down, feather, go forward, not one blade was touching the water, into the water, off they go. This is a matter of practice, discipline and repetition. Practice, discipline, repetition. Practice, discipline, repetition. I still can't do it. Practice, discipline, repetition. It is not okay if your blades touch the water. And I said this in many different videos, it's not about a beauty contest. It's about being able to do this at the kitchen. Go up, see? Your lat stretches a bit, and your lat and your tail is major. These are the muscles you need to transfer force from the trunk into the legs. And if you can't prepare these, but you go forward in stiff mode, you're going to go over the top of the shoulder. Lat isn't going to be as effective as it could be, and you're by far not as quick as you could be. Okay, back to this eight. Let's look at them a bit more. So I see you worked on the timing at the finish because everybody's trying to do this, but at, at finish position, we need to start to work on body positions. So if we look at number six seat, six and seven, distinctively different. A, how wide do you hold the oar handle? There are personal preferences. If you like to hold it narrow, go for it, but be consistent. If you like to hold it wide, do it, but be consistent. I personally like to have it shoulder wide. And I try it because it, it allows me to feel better where the inboard is, so my shoulder girdle can follow the inboard. At the finish, the same. You can't, and this is what you're doing in seven seat, you can't do this. You, you're trying to pull. This is not a linear drive erg. That has nothing to do with rowing. It's a boat environment. So you need to use leverage into the finish, which means you need to play with the shoulder girdle, you need to play with body weight and rotate around and still pivot a bit, okay? You cannot go into a slumped over pull. And that is the issue you've got. Something else I see, I think most of you are trying to accelerate the blade towards the finish. Accelerate the boat. Have the intention to accelerate the boat, not the oar handle. This is why I'm not a big fan of oar handle speed. I think it's a useless barometer. Because if everybody says, my oar handle speed is too slow, you will rip the oar through the water, hoping to accelerate the boat, being completely disconnected from feeling the boat, how much more force can it take in order to accelerate? How much more is there possible in terms of propulsion if I add a bit of more force? If you don't mind this and say, oh, boat speed is a secondary barometer, it's just boat oar handle speed, then you lose connection. You don't feel what's going on. If your aim is, I want to keep my blade locked, and I want to make sure I propel the boat for as long as possible. Once I go through all the drama, going to the catch, connect, and then hold, 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 why don't you extend the drive? Uh, coach said stroke rate should be high. Screw the stroke rate. It's the boat speed that counts. At the finish, you don't want to let go if you still have connection there. Why would you miss a chance to give it a bit more, a bit more? Of course, stroke rate is an important parameter, only if you take advantage of, every, of everything a one full stroke cycle has to offer. If that's not the case, you're rotating a lot, but you're not 
um, you're not creating a lot of boat propulsion or not a lot in comparison to what you could be creating. I see some of these guys are looking out on the blade. Excellent, please do more of that. I like that people look out, especially if you're visual. There is no use in telling people, don't look out. This is not where you stand in line just trying to show your submission. I mean, I was part of the army. I liked the experience. You learn a good deal of discipline. I think that's important. But in a rowing boat, your range of responsibility it goes farther. You're not a functioning unit in something that doesn't need to think. You need to think. You need to look out. You need to feel what's going on. If you don't do this, you're not a resp you're one eighth of this entire boat. You're letting down the entire boat. I don't say look down all look out all the time, but look out when you feel like you need the information. And as a coxswain, <clears throat> if you feel like, hey, you've got athletes who are, I don't look out, encourage them. Every say so, hey, next 10 strokes, everybody looks out to the blade. What? What? Blah. No. The boat isn't going to be offset. If it's going to be offset, it's a mind game. If you can't look out and coordinate your hands, you should work in your coordination. So ask them, look out. What does it look like? If you move like this, what does it look like? These are probably visual communicators. So let them do their thing, okay? But then, if you go to the catch, for everybody in the boat now, the question is how do you end up at the catch? And that's the basic principle I've been hammering in every single video I do. I think in every single one, even the 30, 40 I had to de delete because he's asked me to take them down. It's at the catch, you want to be independent. You need to control the blade, which means your weight is going to be here and on the feet. It's not, you don't use the oar handle to go forward a bit more and, and then you see inside shoulder deeper in the outside shoulder because you do what you do on a linear drive erg where length is generated with with something like this in a, in, in in sweep rowing you want to be parallel with your shoulder girdle to the inboard so it's slightly tilted that way and it's rotating so your shoulder girdle does the same you follow you follow out and the more flexible you become in your shoulder girdle the more you can keep the inside arm bent at the beginning, this is probably not the case. At the beginning, you probably have to bend your inside arm quite a bit until you get the looseness in both of your shoulders. Something else I recommend. Every second session or every third session, no matter how much they bark at you, have people switch sides. You don't want to keep this up forever, but it's a lame argument. Say, I can't row port. I can't row with starboard. You can no, I'm not as good. Who knows? Maybe you've been on the wrong side all your life. There were rowing sessions where I had to switch sides within the session. Was it comfortable? No. But did it help me? Yes. Because you relearn, you leave your motion pattern. You're, you're stepping outside that automated motion for a bit. And this is the big advantage of switching sides. If somebody has a medical condition where switching sides is not recommended, okay. That's a rare thing. So, especially at stages like these, where you're still in a beginner state, switch sides. Do the same drills. Demand the same precision. Be absolutely on your case with this. And then you end up at the catch where you are inside shoulder lower, parallel to the inboard. You reach out and at the catch you should be able to do this. And you know what? That's exactly the kind of drill I would be doing. Six people hold the boat. One pair doesn't have to be right behind each other. It could be, I don't know, stroke and bow, if you're not um, Italian rigged, which I recommend in that boat later on, not a trick. Um, then you would have to say, okay, go to the catch, let go. And you need somebody from the outside monitor. No posture change in the body, nothing, nada, zero. If there is a relaxation, you know they were relying on the oar handle. You can't rely on your oar handle and control it. So, stand still, six people hold the boat, perfect preparation, let go. Square the blade, put the blade in the water, let go immediately. No posture change. And this teaches you that you should sit independently. Okay, last tip for a boat like this. Um, this is what I did with this Asian, uh, Asian team. I did a pretty awkward looking Italian rig, tandem rig. So we would have 
two tandems in the middle of the boat. So it would have um, a regular stroke pair, regular bow pair, and then would have um, either port port, stroke stroke, um, now port port, starboard starboard, or the other way around. Why? I usually put people there who have where the leading person has a good technique and the following person is not so effective for a very simple reason. And a sweep or is long, there's not much space to get around it. Um, so you have to be <laughs> pretty much in sync with the person in front of you. And the next thing is the middle ship is responsible for amplifying the rhythm the stroke pair is generating. So we want to make sure that these four people are in sync. Whatever they do, it's in sync. So we have to make sure that the, the middle ship, these four people, know how to move the boat together. You can't have four people doing random things there. This is why I like to stick them together in a very restricted space and they have to follow and be absolutely in sync with whatever they do. And this helps you to, if, if the stern pair is able to generate good rhythm, you have to, you have to place people with good rhythm in front of the um, respective person following and then you can start to play with rhythm games. Say okay, now we're going to pause longer at the finish. Now we're going to pause mid-drive. Now we're going to um, a mid-recovery. And then everything you do is amplified and they are forced to work together better. Good. One last note, bow pair. I would put the two most technically skilled athletes in bow pair. Um, they can be strong, they can be heavy, I don't mind. If the boat can take it, that's fine. More weight actually will set the boat nicer at the beginning, but make sure you have a reliable bow pair. They will be, they will be almost the backbone of that boat. Okay, with this being said, thank you very much for watching. I hope it helped you, and I hope I was able to help you, Zach, and your team. I wish you all the best. If you have not subscribed, do it now, please. It means a lot to me and it helps me to grow the channel. And check out the new rowing platform that is finally online. It's called rowing.zone. And my vision is to unify the entire rowing community. My handle is Ed Aram on rowing.zone and I'm looking forward to meet you. And a final announcement for the rowing camp in June. A couple more days, a couple slots free here in Vienna, Austria. Go to armtraining.com to learn more. And now I'm looking forward to see you in the next video. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Check it out.